Soumya is a freelance qualitative researcher and an independent ethnographer, a pioneer for visual ethnography in the country. And last year, she was awarded Leading Innovator Visual Ethnographic Research by APAC Business Awards. Soumya is also a mentor for ethnography and qualitative research. She loves poetry, yoga, dance, and visiting historical sites. In today's episode, let us chat with Soumya Sharma. This is the Guiding Voice podcast series, the Guiding Voice for a Better Future. Folks, I'm your host, Navin Samala, just a fellow IT professional on a mission to shape the careers and lives of millions across the globe. In every episode, we interact with industry experts or thought leaders or academicians or coaches across the globe to drive some insightful conversations that will help each one of you learn some amazing stuff. Also, we share an interesting trivia or a fun fact towards the end. And you know, you will acquire more knowledge for every minute by tuning into The Guiding Voice than any other podcast in this space. Thank you so much for joining me today. And today we are going to discuss a very interesting topic, qualitative research and ethnography. In fact, I was very amused when I came across this term ethnography. So let us try to unleash the details of ethnography in this episode. And we are pleased to have Soumya part of TGV's journey in shaping the careers and lives of millions across the globe. Soumya, welcome to TGV and I'm super excited to have you part of our journey today. Hi, Naveen. Uh, thank you for having me and uh, thanks to you for uh, arranging this and um, looking forward to this. I'm very nervous and excited. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you should not be nervous. It is just two of us talking about this topic and while helping our audience also Absolutely. get nuances I'll... of ethnography. All right. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's get yeah. rolling. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. That's the spirit. So, Soumya, let's get started. And uh, in case if you were to explain this ethnography to a layman and where this is used and all, so what would be your take? So, just to understand, in, I'll start with the traditional definition. Uh, so, ethnography is a scientific study. It's, it, it's, a, it's a research study. It started as a part of social sciences. Now, it's also a part of user experience or market research. To simply put ethnographic study or ethnography or ethnographic research, there are different names used uh, in uh, different fraternities, academics or business or corporate. It means uh, studying uh, the habits, the micro nuances or of the users or the participants, or sometimes they use the word subjects, which I personally don't like using, uh, studying the participants in their own natural environment, uh, which means their house or their office or say a place which they frequent. So it's a scientific research study of uh, consumers or participants in their own natural environment. We study, as I mentioned earlier, we study their habits, we study their micro nuances, we study uh, the activities they do, we study the social context or meanings of those activities, we study the cultural patterns or the behaviors of uh, these consumers, uh, not just an individual, but uh, a group. So that's the traditional definition of ethnography. So ethnography started as an academic discipline part of anthropology, sociology, and sometimes other social sciences also, but primarily anthropology and sociology. But uh, when we were just studying the ethnic communities, like tribal societies or folk societies or rural societies per se, but eventually over the past month, the past couple of years, the definition of ethnography per se has changed from being uh, exclusively documentation, per se academic documentation, to commodification. But because now we are doing ethnographic research when it comes to market research or UX research, we are doing ethnographic research in the context of a product. So for example, an ethnographic study on uh, tier two, tier three communities, how do they use um, different Apple products per se? If at all, they use Apple products. So let's say that's that's our case study or that's the research we have to do. So we will do ethnographic study. The context is the Apple product, let's say an Apple phone. And uh, the ethnographic study will be done amongst uh, certain uh, users uh, that have been handpicked based on uh, the need of the research objective. And uh, we will try to study how how they use the phone, when they use the phone, maybe at what time do, 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 do they use the phone, uh, so what activities are involved around it, what habits, what micro nuances, uh, are there any cultural patterns uh, emerging from um, when we do such a study. So that's ethnography, to put it simply. Yeah, this seems to be exciting field. And uh, I, I see that it is of a benefit to 
the product companies a lot right yeah. and in terms of understanding the pattern yeah. so that they can deliver new features according to yeah. the current yeah. consumption and all right and absolutely it uh, benefits uh, it's it is being used also but not as extensively but it benefits advertising branding product folks and definitely market research companies Uh, because the ultimate so qualitative research has been existing and it does exist but what ethnography does is tells us how a product relates to not just a consumer per se uh, how a product relates to uh, the space of the consumer how a product relates to other elements in that space and uh, and how does and and also the personas of the consumer most importantly how do, how is our consumer what's their motivation their way of life their their habits their rituals their you know uh, are there any symbols involved in terms of uh, when we try to understand a product so it is a very uh, field, it's, it's a field study so you are getting a very holistic with the edge and with the wh understanding of a consumer and the interaction with the product Mm-hmm. exciting yeah and i'm now curious how did you get into this domain and in case if somebody wants to get into that is there any specific qualification or something somebody has to pursue or acquire yeah, so, okay so interesting question because about me uh, my father was in the army so i was always exposed to different cultures societies because transferable job and i've always been very curious minded since i was you know uh, in my early days of school i will just quickly narrate an anecdote i remember the first time my father got posted to city different from north india from delhi to west bengal so the first time when i heard the word uh, you know ami tumar ke bhalo bhashi which means i love you in uh, if you translate it and i was i was probably five or six okay i was like six i guess i was surprised oh my god are there different ways different languages also in this world in this country and i was so i was always curious so then over the time i uh, took the decision in in 2012 jan i took the decision to pursue my passion which was obviously my curiosity and inquisitivity and somehow life has been such in a, in a way that my education my mba was in hospitality management and i specialized in you know food production which is again very food is very cultural so that journey sort of i think somewhere universe was kind of pushing me into this journey of understanding people societies and culture and i suddenly made a decision okay leave let's leave everything leave my job or oh, you know nicely paying job and let's get into this you know new unexplored waters great so that's how i started my journey but uh, i recommend people don't be as impulsive as me <laughs> now if you want to get, understand or get into ethnography there, there are no courses exclusively that are there uh, in ethnography now that i as far as i know uh, if it is being offered now i would not know but as far as my knowledge goes if there are no courses being offered it is a part of discipline of anthropology it is a part of discipline of sociology or culture studies so there in especially in anthropology sociology ethnography is taught extensively but others related subjects it may be taught uh, you know as a small um, i how do how do i put it like probably uh, not even a subject like a part of a subject just when you do when they have the internships and all um, that's one way to get into it but see ethnography is a practical science it's an applied science per se right so it doesn't really matter if you uh, get theoretical knowledge from a degree or you get theoretical knowledge from google or books that's uh, get just to get your basic sorted that's just for you to understand what all uh, maybe the skills ex- exist or theories exist or maybe to read about works of previous ethnographers or case studies of ethnographic research done across businesses so but it's ultimately uh, the more you practice in the field the more you're out there in the field and when i say field i'm taking both online and offline as the field because ethnography is traditional it's digital it's mobile uh, the latter two are more recent comparatively and yes visual ethnography so that's how i would uh, suggest anyone uh, just it is practice it is i would say 90% practice and maybe 10% theory <laughs> and and this seems to be creative field as well and wherein you are trying to combine multiple uh, different domains and trying to draw some insights and it involves sort of creative thinking or out of the box thought process and uh, i believe you teach this to your students and all and really curious how do you teach creative thinking in general Okay, so creative thinking is something 
that cannot be really taught. You can, I can just teach my students as to the best practices or how I do it. Some things that I tell the students that uh, A, also be mindful and aware about biases because I think most of the times it's a biases that disrupt our creative thinking, our analytical thinking for that matter, especially creative thinking. So be aware of your biases. Try to embrace different perspectives. It is also important to because what is anything creative? It, it is always an you know accumulation of different thoughts. You know, if it was just very linear, we won't be able to create anything. That's how my, that's what my thought is. Uh, and also, I also try to teach that, uh, which is again maybe somewhere related to biases that we have to understand and accept that uh, aesthetics is not just beauty. In fact, uh, Monday itself, I presented a paper in Punjab University. So I was teaching the teachers over there. So, uh, so which was again, uh, no bracking for me teaching the teachers. <laughs> so I was teaching them uh, visual ethnography in real time, user experience research and beyond. Where, and I was trying to understand, don't be in a rush to go uh, behind aesthetics of how perfect your image looks or visual looks, because aesthetics is very subjective. Aesthetics is uh, it's like a juxtaposition of uh, of subjectivity and culture. What uh, is uh, aesthetically beautiful for Soumya might not be aesthetically beautiful or appealing for Navi. So that's another thing I teach in creative thinking. And uh, yeah, patience and empathy. I think two things uh, which is uh, also very important. I feel empathy everybody talks about, but I find patience also and perseverance. I would also want to give an example here of uh, Van Gogh. So Van Gogh has this painting called Sunflower. So Van Gogh kept painting those sunflowers. He had multiple iterations of those sunflower paintings only because he wanted to uh, perfect the representation of those sunflowers in uh, as the way they were appearing in his mind, that painting. So that's another thing that I also teach my students. Uh, it's about aesthetic goals and representations. We always have an aesthetic goal that this should look this way. And, and it's, it all comes with practice. So it's always practice, not perfection. And uh, you need to also be uh, self-reflexive in everything that you do when you are looking. You want to work on your creative thinking or you want to apply your uh, creative thinking. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's few things. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Like you teach what you practice and all. Yeah. It seems to be something very challenging as well. And now let's talk about the second part of our topic. How, how does one go about the qualitative research? Because I think it involves uh, numbers, metrics, and is there any dependency with the data and technology? What's your take on that? Okay, so qualitative research is a part of market research or user experience research. So user experience or market research is divided into quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative is all numbers, surveys, NPS, CSAT, CES score. Uh, there are other things also. Uh, and qualitative is more about understanding the motivations of consumers, their habits, their challenges or their aspirations. So it is all about getting a more holistic with the edge, with the WH um, perspective or understanding of your consumers. So that's what qualitative research and qualitative research, there are different kinds of qualitative research methods. Ethnography is a part of it. Then we have, uh, you know, interviews, we have focus group discussion, we have usability testing or uh, usability study, we have desirability study, there are different methods. And uh, the purpose of qualitative research is uh, either it can be, uh, there are three purposes mostly, either it is exploratory, we're trying to understand the who our consumer base is and what do they want? What are the challenges? If you are, a, let's say, a new business entering into a market and uh, you have some idea that, okay, these are of the consumers because there are the competitors in the market using the offering the same product, but you do not know what the consumers want, what's their workaround, what's their journey like, what are their aspirations? Basically, you, you have to, the purpose of qualitative research is to help us uh, create or do not not just create define and have a actionable and meaningful uh, value proposition canvas wherein you have your values that you offer as a business at one side and you have the consumer needs pains and gains and the jobs the consumers are trying to achieve which is the needs again on the other side so that's the the biggest usp of uh, qualitative research so yeah yeah that's clear and now uh, share with our audience the top three things that have helped you excel in your professional journey so far. 
Okay, so I would say curiosity. I for to excel as a researcher, ethnographic, qualitative researcher, uh, either of it, you have to be very curious minded and be childlike. When I do, I don't mean curiosity uh, in the just in the sense of uh, how adults perceive as curiosity. Be childlike because child's mind is always. It's there are no biases per se. There are uh, it's uh, it's like almost like always a clean slate whenever you talk to someone new. So that's the reason. Uh, be curious like a child. Um, be self reflexive, which I mean uh, uh, more into self reflection in the sense. Is and, and it is extremely important as a for a researcher to be self reflexive because some of the times challenges we face is the consumers or the participant responses changes or varies depending on according to the researcher's present presence in the field or let's say during a research interview so we have to uh, keep going back to our research question and understand that okay was this answer more dramatized or uh, you know uh, or orchestrated per se did i ask leading questions was he or she uh, the or uh, or the participant saying things because i was present because he wanted to give a right answer because i did not tell him or her that there are no right or wrong answer it's just your perspective so there are different methods we do to ensure that we are being self reflexive then finally progress over perfection so do not do not be goal oriented that i want to come up with this result because uh, this is what would be beneficial for my business no that's not how it should be you think about the result come up with the key insights only after talk with the consumers i hope that makes sense <laughs> No, absolutely. I think you've uh, touched upon three important aspects: curiosity, reflexivity, and patience. Yes, uh, that's wonderful. And, and uh, actually, progress and, over perfection. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, Swami, I was researching your profile, and I found some interesting aspect. Like you seem to be working on future of school. Yeah. Like, can you share some insights into that project? Okay, I'll tell you about the project. I can't share the insights. <laughs> yeah. So the project is uh, I can't name the client, obviously. So the um, the project uh, it's a company called Canvas Eight. That's a behavioral insights uh, cultural cultural research agency based in London. So the that has hired me as the researcher for India. So the project Future of Schools. Uh, I'm working as a freelance researcher for India for a company called Canvas Eight, which is a behavioral insights and cultural research agency based. in london so this research is happening across uh, eu apac latam usa so i guess i don't know what uh, 30 or 30 plus countries i have not really counted and i am working for india uh, the project started in uh, first week of march we are right now in the uh, report making stage for uh, india and uh, so that's what and we are trying to un- uh, you know uncover or trying to figure out things uh, what the future of schools will be like from the perspective of innovation from the perspective of you know tech and innovation which is also including ai also looking at future of schools from the perspective of curriculum pedagogy does that need to change what are the challenges students have educators have so it's, we are trying to present a very uh, come up with a very holistic perspective holistic picture of what uh, future of schools uh, looks like uh, we spoke to a couple of uh, education experts from india um, because i was handling i'm handling india so obviously i'll speak to people from india so there were experts from different uh, fields uh, in education different domains in education field so that's what the entire project uh, is about uh, that's yeah. a bit about it <laughs> as much as i can <laughs> share yeah no, no thanks for thanks for that and uh, this seems to be Uh, very exciting right i think uh, whole pedagogy that uh, is going to be different from what at least our generation has been through yeah. and the current generation is going through right yeah i'm super jealous at times of <laughs> what is on offer <laughs> what the uh, for <laughs> times to come yeah. Uh, yeah let's let's hope we get there so absolutely yeah and now can we uh, talk a bit about this digital or mobile ethnography Okay, sure. So, uh, digital and mobile ethnography is simply like in traditional ethnography, a researcher is there in the field, 
in uh, in a consumer's or participant's house office it's is in the field uh, but in digital or mobile ethnography mobile is just mobile ethnography using a mobile phone and uh, digital is um, which is you may use other devices also that's that's the one of the differences and in mobile ethnography we also call it as a diary study or life logging those are the other names of it what we do is instead of uh, since we cannot go in the field and uh, you know remote research kind of uh, really promoted or propagated the use of mobile ethnography we send questions every day to consumers based on our research objective so the things that we might have uncovered in the field by being present in the field physically we kind of do it by sending uh, questions maybe three questions or four questions maybe one two depending on the research uh, that we are doing to the consumers and then in uh, it can be that then they send us responses in the way of text audio visual or uh, uh yeah so these are the three uh, uh, multimedia ways they send us and uh, digital ethnography is also this because mobile ethnography also would fall kind of under digital ethnography but digital ethnography would also mean understanding the online communities around your product it would also mean uh, say getting into these facebook groups discords or maybe instagram you know assessing the hashtags assessing the online conversations and uh, so and understanding what uh, rituals or symbols or uh, traditions are coming up around your product when you talk about online so uh, example on twitter sometimes hashtags go viral then we try to understand are there any norms coming up uh, is there any shared belief or shared practice or shared thoughts or feelings around that product so it is just uh, we have bought the field to uh, to online so that's it offline to off- online that's what digital ethnography in simple words is uh, there are uh, pros and cons to both traditional ethnography and digital ethnography uh, in traditional ethnography there's a chance or challenge of something called as a hawthorne effect which means that as i mentioned that uh, the users or the consumers the participants would answer uh, more um, dramat give more dramatized answers uh, that's the challenge and uh, when which does not happen digital ethnography so which is the usp of digital ethnography and in digital ethnography you are able to uh, what you miss is uh, fly on the wall insights because that only happens when you are in the field because in digital ethnography consumer will only send answers to what uh, you've asked for yeah so if there's a pro uh, and cons both to it. they'll send answers to what you've asked for and also they will uh, send sometimes they send answers much more than what you've asked for so it's like you know both ways interesting i think um, this is something very new to me and i'm learning a lot of things uh, in today's conversation yeah. and uh, sam i'm also curious on this research design and recruitment especially like i'm i'm trying to understand how do you someone uh, design research part <laughs> okay so research design depends on the research problem and objective which and what we are solving for what problem we are trying to understand what's a business objective so that's the 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 way research design works so in a in a in a classic and typical research design which is oh let's say what i have mostly done is there is first a discovery research or a secondary or desk research where you read watch into everything that's available around your research problem or research question which helps you to form your hypothesis and basis that the next step is uh, you get into primary research but before primary research or, or like a um how do i say like like a bridge between uh, <laughs> secondary research and primary research is this process of screening and recruiting which is supposedly one of the most difficult uh, things that happens in research where you have to identify the right consumer because it's not just you cannot go ahead and interview or talk to just anybody who's using your product you or who who you want to uh, use your product so you have to be uh, that's where screening happens or recruiting happens where uh, we scout for uh, that that's another place where in something of digital ethnography can come into place in fact one one friend today asked me a question as to how do i find my right consumer or how do how do i find the right tg so that's what we do in screening and recruiting we uh, you can go ahead and look into online communities uh, around that product or that industry you can look at hashtags that are there that will tell you the kind of people who are using that product so these are some of the ways this is what happens once we are done with the screening we have uh, 
uh, figured out who would be our 2025 odd participants with whom we want to do qualitative research, like the primary research, then we do the research, then there's analysis, and then there's report making. And primary research, depending on what sort of uh, research we are doing, is, is it exploratory, then we just do interviews or focus group discussions, sometimes diary studies. Is it cause and effect? We do uh, we do things like usability studies or desirability study. So that's what uh, you know in gist a uh, research design uh, looks like. Okay, so we are trying to take inputs from multiple sources and combine everything and drive some insights, meaningful insights, right? So how I'm really curious again to understand how do we derive meaningful insights out of all this data that is amalgamated and all. How do we basically, how do we do analysis? Is that the question? No, my question is more about how do we uh, derive meaningful insights out of the analysis? Uh, so the meaningful insight comes from analysis. That's the reason in qualitative research, uh, we should always aim for uh, interviewing or including uh, 20 to 25 participants. Uh, that's the sweet number. The reason it is because an insight can only be called an insight or a key finding if it has been articulated by more number of people. If just one consumer says, oh, I think this is my challenge or this is what my aspiration with the product, it cannot go into as an insight because uh, you, you cannot be, let's be honest, <laughs> you cannot be making every consumer happy. So you have to kind of go towards the majoritarian view, what most people are saying. And uh, after qualitative research or simultaneously, Mostly afterwards, there's always quantitative research, which helps to ratify or nullify what the qualitative research has mentioned. So uh, once the, so the key insights come up from how many uh, times a particular pain point or a gain or an aspiration or uh, a motivation per se was articulated by a number of people. So let's say assume we are doing a, uh, doing a research study on an e-commerce platform, fashion e-commerce, and out of 25, if five or six uh, people have said, uh, at least have said that our biggest challenge is there is a lack of personalization on the platform, which means it would go into an insight. It means that the business or the product guys or the developing developers or designers, whoever would be the next steps have to, or, or, or most importantly, the business owner has to consider providing that personalized personalization or customization in the platform. So that's how you derive it. Wow. All right. So this has been very insightful conversation so far, Sam. But I would like to lighten up the mood of our audience by <laughs> initiating a quick rapid fire round. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask you. Will I get the coffee hamper? Like, absolutely. <laughs> and, and even a dinner hamper. Okay. <laughs> Not just coffee. All right. <laughs> Great. So let me fire the first bullet out of the rapid fire and you can be as crisp as possible. And uh, what was your childhood fantasy, Sam? Childhood fantasy, uh, I wanted to be He-Man. <laughs> <laughs> your favorite book? <laughs> okay. Um, there are many, but I would say the recent one I'm uh, about to finish, it's called Anthrovision by Gillian Tech. It talks about how anthropology can be used uh, to understand business problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. I'm going to publish the uh, book description and the link in the show notes for the benefit of the audience. Anthrovision, right? Anthrovision, yeah. It's yeah. by Gillian Ted. Yeah. All right, great. So moving to the next one, describe yourself in just one word. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm okay. I'll say curious minded. Definitely, that's one. That's thing. two words, yeah. but, but that's two words, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll consider only the first word, curious. All right. So moving on, you mentioned about uh, fantasizing being a human. What is one super <laughs> power you wish to have? Shapeshifter, <laughs> definitely shapeshifter. Good. All right. So let me fire the last bullet out of the rapid fire. What yeah. is one electronic gadget that you would like to see or invent yourself, Sam? See or invent into myself. I'm a very uh, use tech as per the need, uh, but uh, I would want uh, a gadget, something in the field of health tech. That's where I uh, I would want to you know invent a gadget where in uh, people who are old or are terminally ill or falling sick, you know you can just. Uh, maybe click a button or something and a buzzer of sorts and uh, the the closest hospital gets notified something around that yeah no oh, that's a noble cause and i wish somebody develops an app uh, or a gadget yeah, yeah. so yeah. wonderful 
and this has been a fabulous rapid fire and before i let you go uh, one final question for today's conversation what is your one piece of advice to those aspiring to make begin their career sam i would say progress over perfection as i mentioned earlier if you have to be goal focused but do not start from there because otherwise in your mind you'll always be trying to uh, um, you know look at uncover insights do research ask questions uh, very leading questions from the perspective of the goal that you want to achieve so look just look at progress and progress also means self reflexivity so that's my piece of advice simply wow in fact at tgv okay. also we believe progress over perfection that's yeah. why we make incremental change episode after the other a one yeah, episode after wonderful. one episode yeah. yeah that's wonderful to know <laughs> yeah great. great i think uh, this has been an exciting conversation and thank you sam for joining us yeah. today and thank you for being part of our journey in shaping the careers and lives of millions across the globe Great. Uh, thank you, Naveen. It was wonderful. I'm just wondering what will people think when they hear that I wanted to be he man. I hope they take me seriously after this. So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Thank yeah. you, Naveen, for having me. Thank you so All much. right. So, yeah. pleasure hosting you. Okay. And folks, before we move into the trivia section, here is a small request to all of you. In case if you haven't subscribed to us, please subscribe from the app where you have tuned in from, so that you will be notified about all our future episodes. Also, if you have loved this conversation just like I did and found it useful, please share with at least three of your friends or colleagues who can benefit from the guiding voice. Because your friends will learn new stuff like you and will gain a few new new subscribers. Thank you so much in advance. Now, let's cruise into the trivia segment of today's episode. And today's trivia is about entrepreneurs and also self-employed people. and you know 97% of the self employed people don't plan on returning to traditional work no wonder that is true in fact i have observed many entrepreneurs not getting back to the work unless it is something truly circumstantial and all and you know this was found by an annual report published by fresh books in 2019 and they also found that 45% of the millennials said they would work past retirement and 47% of gen z and 61% of the baby boomers they said given a choice they will work but they didn't expect that they are going to work for sure and in fact this statistic is not surprising since the same research found that entrepreneurs and self employed professionals enjoy greater career satisfaction and if we were to uh, add some number it would be about 71% in comparison to people holding down traditional jobs who have a career satisfaction of 61% and interestingly the satisfaction level increases with age income and work life balance and that's all for today yeah. thank you so much for joining me and this is your host navin a fellow it professional and a passionate learner on a mission to make a difference in the lives of millions across the globe until next time bye bye yeah.